Come see. <laughs> this is our fitness and health panel. Without Erica O'Grady. So if you're looking for Erica O'Grady, she couldn't make it, I don't know why. So this is our fitness. This is just what you've been waiting for now. <laughs> Weight loss, diet, health. I have Fred DeVito. Laura McDonald. McDonald. Jenna Drew. Jenna Drew. Okay, so I want to talk about and I'm Fred. I'll start with Fred because I, I work out with Fred and then we'll work our way down. Fred, people start out. My biggest thing about exercise is that you have to go every day or at least four to five days a week. <clears throat> what happens to people who say they're going to do it, they want to do it, they start doing it, and they give up. I will like to forget for the moment the people who just don't show up. How about the people who just show up and disappear? Let me ask you four to five times a week, when you first started your habit, was it four to five times I've, a week? I've worked out four to five times a week since I was 18. Okay, so a lot of people in their adult lives, as I mentioned this morning when I did my talk, if you come from a background of high school or junior high school physical education classes where I was a PE teacher in the middle school for five years before I started to teach adults which are just grown up kids, same thing. But the kids who performed athletically on the teams did great in gym class and they wanted to be there and they were having fun. The kids who were out of shape, maybe overweight, a little klutzy, they always came in with notes excusing them from gym class. They, Gym class was always competitive, so the, the, the kid who had the problems was the first one eliminated, last one picked when they were picking teams, really bad self-esteem things going on. And now take that into adult, they're already programmed to think of movement as something they're not good at. So when, when I reach, when I have someone like that, like that come into my class, I'm trying to understand what is their background and how can I get them to take a baby step? come once or twice a week to get it started. Commit to something that's palatable, something you can do, and then after once or twice a week, maybe we can build on that. But they need to see results, and they need to feel proud of their accomplishments. So if it's movement that's challenging them, and then they start to see changes from those challenges, and they feel proud of that, that's the motivation that gets them to come back if they fall off the wagon. They want to be proud of themselves. you and I don't want to be I don't want to argue but I think there's more come I mean, back at me Tracy come back at you. <laughs> you know, we a lot of people write into the, our website gratitude and trust which I mentioned today gratitudeandtrust.com and the biggest thing people complain about is being overweight sugar addiction mm -hmm. and a complete inability to control their food their exercise they ex express extreme desire they extreme abs they express absolutely no follow-through or ability to do it well, you, what, do you, I, like, what do you, Leah, what do you yeah. see in that, Laura? Did um, you? Well, I see that most of us really have to have ch flip a switch. We have to make up our mind. So that applies to pretty much anything. You know, um, a lot of talk today about addiction. You know, you have to decide that's not the person I want to be anymore. And you don't want to be a whiner and a complainer. And there is no magic bullet. I tell every one of my new clients or groups, there's no magic bullet. And what I try to impart with them, and I'll give you a quick example, I recently started working with a 75-year-old who had never exercised. She lives in New York, she's very active, she walks a lot. Within a few months, she lost weight, her energy increased, and she actually told me, I look forward to exercising. And I said, why? She said, because I feel better. And so I think that's really the most important thing. But for people who want to exercise and eat better, they, they have to do it, they need to find the support, um, and I think once they do start doing it and they start feeling the results, their confidence gets better, they feel that surge in energy and clarity and focus, maybe they're sleeping better, um, hopefully they'll become addicted to that. I, we see that ha happening all the time. You know, the statistics on people who lose weight and, you know, and gain weight back <laughs> are much higher than the statistics for people who lose weight and keep weight off. The statistics for people who sign up for gyms and the people who continue to go to the gyms and everyone in, runs in January and everyone by right. February is abandoned. It. So clearly the endorphins and the looking in the mirror and buying a size smaller jean doesn't always play out. 
how, how do you, how does that appear in your work and how, what, what is your anecdote to that? And how, do you do, how do you fix that? Because that's the <laughs> real problem. I definitely say the accountability is not just having the desire to do it, but have people holding you accountable to actually doing it. And whether it's a private program or group that you're involved in, or if it's somebody at the front of the gym, the receptionist who welcomes you and greets you and makes you feel like you're a part of their community to make you feel accountable to, hey, I need to show up because the receptionist is gonna know I didn't come today so I need to be there. And it's also not just the exercise, but I think the food has a lot to do with it too because say you're working out extra hard at the gym, you're going home and you're eating deep fried chicken wings or you know, something like that, the two aren't aligned together. So to have results, you can't just exercise, but you need to eat right too. And we're all busy. If you guys are all from New York, it's like you don't have time to eat breakfast in the morning. So make something the night before, have it ready, make it easy for yourself to do these good things for your health. Well, I think people always say, I, I, you know, people always say, I, I don't have time, is something you always hear. Because people say to me, how do you have time to go to the gym? How, I don't have time. I mean, I'm a really busy person. I get there every morning early. You know, I know if I don't get there by nine, I won't get there. I think that, I think, how do you make it a part of your day that become, I mean, that it's non-negotiable. I, th I think that it's so easy. I think people, st the falling off the wagon, it's why it's an addiction. It's why it, it fits into this conference for me. It's also about like, why is it not a day at a time? People don't, like they'll go for a week, they don't go for three days, and then they go, oh, screw it, I'm never going back, right? I mean, it, it yeah. becomes three days goes into now, I'm gonna just eat Krispy Kremes. Well, I like to tell students that when you make all of your appointments in the week, the meeting with the CEO and the meeting with whoever, when you put the exercise class in your calendar, it's the most important appointment of the week because it's the appointment you make with yourself. And if you don't take care of yourself, and if you don't feel good about yourself, everything else in your world, everybody else that you're touching or affecting is affected by the fact that you're not feeling good about yourself. And Jenna touched on it. Students say to me, how do I get the rip six pack? How do I get those abs? And I say, abs are made in the kitchen. Honest to God. You need, if you don't have your diet and your food lined up to correlate with your goals, then you're never gonna see the results that you wanna see, and that's when you're gonna fall off the wagon. Why am I gonna exercise and do all of this work if I look in the mirror and I don't look any different than I looked a month ago? So if you're not doing the right things with your food, and that's the thing with food is that you're eating late at night, you know, it's the unconscious emotional eating that goes on when you're under stress and you're at your desk and you're picking up something fast and you're not preparing your own food. I think in, in Ab's Diet, which is a book from David Sisinko, a really great author about the topic, the percentage of the people who are overweight are, are very highly correlated with people who don't eat breakfast at home. You eat breakfast on the road, you're gonna be putting on weight. It's like there's a high correlation of that. So food preparation has to be played in. It's very no, important. No IHOP. <laughs> um, that, you can say all these things that we all know because obviously we're all, it's preaching the converted on this, on this panel. You can just even to forget the six pack, you can forget the good thighs, you can forget everything else. How about the health issue? I mean right now, overweight, obesity, sugar, Diabetes are the biggest health problems this country faces. And I know so many people who are sick and will not stop. They just, you know, that's it. They go on, they go on, they go on. They'll plummet insulin, they get stents, and they keep going on their path. You, you guys are the experts. They have to make uh, radical changes that are actually, they sound radical to them, but they're actually really simple changes. And I try to tell my clients and my groups I work with, start small. You know, a lot of people just simply don't drink enough water. I mean, they drink a lot of diet soda, which we know now is bad for us. Uh, diet soda actually triggers stuff in our brain that makes us want to eat more. But they think, uh, you know, I'm having this big diet soda and I'm not eating the, the, the bad food. So just drinking more water, trying to get a little more sleep, and prioritizing the exercise as an appointment schedule with yourself, because I firmly believe if you don't take care of yourself first, put the oxygen mask on first, I think is a great saying, then everyone else is affected. And 
You know, I know for me personally, getting out and moving, I love working out outside, even just taking a, a, a walk, power walk with my dog. I, I think, I sort things out. I come home, I'm a nicer person, I'm a happier person. I'm more likely to make healthier food choices because I did just sweat my butt off for 45 minutes or an hour. So it all starts, but you have to take that first small step and continue with that, keep building on that. And I think the key is too, is finding what works for you because we can sit up here and talk all day about this plan is the best or that plan is the best, but really it's about bio-individuality and finding out what exercise program gets you excited. What makes you wanna to go to the gym? Are you a cyclist? Are you a Pilates person, yoga, runner? It doesn't matter just as long as you're exercising. And that goes with the foods as well, where not every ingredient works for every person. Uh, I'm, I have celiac, so I have to stay away from gluten, but dairy doesn't suit me well either. You might have issues with sugars. You might have issues with cashews. Go on a different diet, test different ingredients, and find out if those foods are causing inflammation. And we're all individual, so our food should be too, and our exercise. Okay, but one last question before we go. It's very easy to talk about going to the gym and going to Pilates and food groups, but then there's a whole socioeconomic component to this argument too and this, and this dialogue, which is the person who doesn't have the time to go to the gym, they say, because they've got to get the kids to school, that they don't have any care, health care, or they don't have health care, and they don't have child care, that making healthy meals is more expensive, it's mm -hmm. easier to go drive through McDonald's. What about, and the largest percentage of our country that does have this problem, unfortunately, is a portion of our population that does not economically have the advantages others have. So how do you, count, how do you counteract that? What's the, what, is, what are some of the solutions where we can go into that community and help that out and get that awareness up? Well, first of all, you don't have to go to a class to exercise. I bought more people your DVD and still don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I was a kid, I was outside on my bike and in the playground, and, and I, we just, we had a more active lifestyle than kids do today. They're behind, you know, all of the gadgets and then they're on social media, and all of that's fun, but there's a missing component to just moving in general. And I would suggest that if you're in that category, find something that you love to do and do it. Put your headphones on and go power walk. You don't need to be in a class with a group, especially if you're not proud of your body or you don't like the way you look. You still have to move because without movement, your health will begin to deteriorate. One tip from you, on our I, I would say um, I have a class and group in the city, and if you can get together with some friends, someone who's maybe in a similar situation, your partner, and you plan it together and you commit together, it can really help you hold each other accountable, and it's free, and you can catch up, and you can get some exercise activity in. Jenna? One from you, because we're on our way out. I see Dean staring here. I'd say get a dog. I have a husky, and if I don't walk her, I'm in big trouble. I love that. Yeah. Get a dog. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but it doesn't have to be a class. There are so many free programs, especially in Central Park over the summer or different parks around here. Find something that's free and fun to do, or else you won't do it. There's also lots of uh, videos now online. You can just put anything in, virtually anything, and you'll have a, a video come up. You can follow right at home. You don't even have to leave. So eat an apple and take a walk. <laughs> yes. And that and is our panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>